Hi y'all and welcome back. This is Professor True Love's Concepts for Nurses series and I am Professor Terry True Love. And in this episode, part of the respiratory series, we're going to be looking at restrictive lung diseases, including cystic fibrosis, interstitial lung diseases, fibrosis, and occupational lung diseases. And although technically these aren't all airway problems, for instance, the restrictive lung diseases have to do with the loss of elasticity, essentially they all will affect gas exchange. Sources for this presentation include Iggy's Medical Surgical Nursing, as well as Sol's Introduction to Critical Care Nursing. A problem with many of the obstructive lung diseases is the inability to let trapped air out. In restrictive lung diseases, the presence of mucus or the loss of elasticity of the lungs makes it difficult to get air back in. And one of the diseases that causes a clogging up of the airways is called cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease affecting many organs, lethally impairing pulmonary function and causing impairment of many of the other organs it affects. It is caused by an error in chloride transport. This means that the mucus has very little water and is thick. This thick, sticky mucus causes problems in the lungs, pancreas, liver, salivary glands, and testes. The mucus plugs up the airways in the lungs and the glandular tissues in non-pulmonary organs, causing atrophy in organ dysfunction. Non-pulmonary problems include pancreatic insufficiency, malnutrition, intestinal obstruction, poor growth, male sterility, and cirrhosis of the liver. Other problems associated with CF in young adults include osteoporosis and diabetes mellitus. However, you should know that respiratory failure is the main cause of death. Improved medical management has increased life expectancy to about 40 years. Non-pulmonary manifestations of CF in adults includes that they are usually smaller and thinner than the average person owing to malnutrition. There's usually abdominal distension, the patient has a history of GERD, rectal prolapse, and foul-smelling stools, and steatorrhea, or the presence of large amounts of fat in the stool. And since many vitamins are fat-soluble, and there's a problem with fat, vitamin deficiencies are common. Pulmonary manifestations include frequent respiratory infections, chest congestion, limited exercise tolerance, cough and sputum production, the use of accessory muscles while breathing, decreased pulmonary function test, particularly the amount or the volumes, changes in the chest x-rays, that is, the shape of the lungs and chest, and an increased anterior-posterior diameter. They are also subject to becoming barrel chested CF is usually diagnosed in childhood. It is a slow progressive disease that affects multiple systems and is complex and lifelong. Nutrition management needs to focus on weight maintenance, vitamin supplementation, diabetes management, and pancreatic enzyme replacement. Preventative and or maintenance therapy include chest physiotherapy to promote expectoration of thickened secretions, positive expiratory pressure or PEEP, active cycle breathing techniques, which combine three different breathing techniques in order to ease the expectoration of the thickened mucus, the first of which is called breathing control, which helps to relax the airways. The patient is instructed to breathe in through their nose and out through their mouth with as little effort as possible, breathing as normally and gently as possible. The second technique is chest expansion exercises. The patient's instructed to breathe in deeply, maybe have them hold their breath for up to three seconds, and then to breathe out without forcing the air out. This may be accompanied by chest physiotherapy. The third technique is called huffing or huff coughing, and it's kind of a forced expiratory technique where the patient does limited but forceful huffs in an effort to clear the secretions, until, and they'll continue to do this until all of the secretions have been cleared from the lungs. You should also consider exercise to increase endurance. Non-surgical management during a crisis, known as exacerbation therapy, is needed when a patient with CF has increased chest congestion, reduced activity intolerance, increased or new onset crackles, and a 10% decrease in forced expiratory volume in one second. 
Other symptoms to note include increased sputum production with bloody or purulent sputum, increased coughing, decreased appetite, weight loss, fatigue, decreased saturation, and chest muscle retraction. There may be the presence of infection. Every attempt should be made to avoid mechanical ventilation for a patient with CF, but do provide bilateral positive airway pressure or BiPAP and oxygen. This type of patient may benefit from an air mixture of helium and oxygen instead of nitrogen and oxygen because helium and oxygen is a less dense gas. Use the aforementioned airway clearance techniques. Consider drug therapy, including antibiotics, because CF patients are susceptible to a critter named B. sepacea. And teach the patient to prevent these exacerbations by protecting themselves, by not routinely shaking hands, kissing in social settings, and maintaining proper hand washing techniques. Surgical management for CF includes lung and or pancreatic transplants. Remember, these do not cure, but they can extend the life by anywhere up to 10 to 20 years. However, it is not a cure. The patient is at continued risk for lethal pulmonary infections. However, the patient's quality of life can be greatly improved, including the increased exercise tolerance. Again, the lack of available lungs makes it very uncommon for them to receive these kind of procedures. General pulmonary hypertension can occur as a complication of other lung disorders. However, primary pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH, which is also known as idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, occurs in the absence of other lung disorders, that is, the cause is unknown. With PAH, the blood vessels constrict with increased vascular resistance in the lung. This reduces perfusion, which changes gas exchange. Over time, the heart will failure. Remember, the patient will have cor pulmonal. And without treatment, death will occur within about two years. It is more common in women between 20 and 40 years of age but is considered a rare disorder. Common early symptoms are dyspnea and fatigue in an otherwise healthy adult. Some patients also complain of an angina-like chest pain. PAH is classified by its severity. Diagnosis can be obtained from the results of a right-sided heart catheterizations, which shows elevated pulmonary pressures. A big danger from the change in blood flow is the formation of blood clots. Warfarin is taken daily to achieve an INR of between 1.5 and 2. Calcium channel blockers are used to dilate blood vessels. Endothelin receptor agonists have been shown to be the most effective in the treatment of PAH by causing blood vessel relaxation and a decrease in pulmonary arterial pressure. However, they do cause overall vasodilation and can cause hypotension. And although natural and synthetic, Prostocycillin agents provide the best specific dilation of pulmonary blood vessels. The problem is that these medications are highly prone to error, particularly when given in an IV route. PAH often results in heart failure. Digoxin, diuretics, and oxygen therapy are often indicated. Interstitial pulmonary diseases include sarcoidosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and Occupational lung disease affect the alveoli, the blood vessels, and surrounding support lung tissues. They are restrictive diseases in which the thickened lung tissues are stiffer than normal and make it difficult to bring the air in. This reduces gas exchange. These diseases have a slow onset and dyspnea is the most common manifestation. Sarcoidosis is a granulomatous disorder of unknown causes where the lung is affected most often. We know it is an autoimmune response. The normally protective T lymphocytes increase and damage the lung tissues. Because of this, corticosteroids are the main therapy, but also dyspnea management and long-term community health care, including the resources like the American Lung Association, can be helpful to patients diagnosed with sarcoidosis. A common restrictive lung disease is known as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Usually this patient is older and has a history of cigarette smoking, chronic exposure to inhalation irritants, or exposures to the drugs amiodarone or amrocentin. It is highly lethal because of the extensive fibrosis and scarring that occurs in the lungs. 
dyspnea is the most common manifestation. Therapy is focused on slowing the fibrotic process in managing the dyspnea. This is going to be accomplished by the use of medications to reduce the immune response, including corticosteroids and other immunosuppressants, and these medications should be started early in order to reduce, that is, slow the progression. Nursing care should focus on helping the patient and family understand what the disease process is and maintaining hope for fibrosis control, and it is important to prevent respiratory infections. Teach the patient about signs and symptoms related to infection, and also teach them to avoid respiratory irritants, crowds, and other people who are ill. The patient will have oxygen and other medications while at home and will also benefit from community resources such as the American Lung Association. In the later stages of the disease, the patient will have chronic dyspnea and all of the anxiety, panic, and fear that go along with it. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is often linked to occupational pulmonary diseases. These are pulmonary diseases that are caused by occupational or environmental exposure from fumes, dust, vapors, gases, bacterial or fungal antigens, and allergens. These conditions are made worse by cigarette smoke, and prevention is done through special respirators and maintaining adequate ventilation. It's been mentioned that many of these conditions will require surgical intervention. I wanted to differentiate some of the surgical procedures done on the lungs, particularly the differences between a wedge resection, and a pneumonectomy. The pneumonectomy is the removal of an entire lung. A lobectomy is the removal of a lobe of the lung and is not quite as large, of course, as a pneumonectomy. Smaller than that, that is, removing a smaller portion of the lung, revolves removing a segment, or a segmentectomy. Removes a wedge-shaped section of lung tissue surrounding either a tumor or other affected area of the lung procedures remove areas of the lung which are now no longer functional as gas exchange units. And that is the end of this episode. However, we still have a way to go for the respiratory concepts. I do hope you've learned a little bit. I hope you plan on coming back and listening some more. And if you are, we'll see you then. Take care now.